Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, my talk is going to be a pitch to Ardman because I think uh, the topic that I'm about to talk about would lend itself beautifully, I think, to animation. Uh, and uh, so I'll be talking about the topic called regenerative cities. And I have to say, quite a bit of the ideas that I'll be talking about have actually evolved in part from work I've been doing in Bristol with uh, people like John Ponting. Uh, I was working with John uh, for, for many years uh, on trying to develop uh, urban regeneration initiatives here in Bristol. Uh, but the topic is actually goes beyond urban regeneration to uh, what I call regenerative cities. So this is a bit of a challenging sort of topic because it, the argument is basically the, that we need to begin to think beyond sustainability. We need to begin to develop, actively work on developing a regenerative relationship between cities and the world's ecosystem on which cities ultimately depend. So this is a brief summary of my talk, urban growth and energy use, urban footprints compared with ecological footprints. Then there's recently been a book called The Triumph of the City, which I'll be challenging a bit in my talk, understanding cities as input-output systems. I think that's the sort of key to my arguments. And then, as I already said, beyond sustainability towards regenerative development. I've got a case study similar in some ways to what we've heard uh, about from Freiburg uh, and what we'll be hearing about later on uh, from Curitiba, from Jaime Lerner, and then finally towards regenerative urban development. So here a few sort of images showing the extraordinary change that has taken place on the face of this earth, not just from 1850s onwards, in fact, before that, with the start of the Industrial Revolution. It is just astonishing to be, I come from anthropology, that's my academic background. And when you sort of look at the way we've lived as hunter-gatherers on this planet for millions of years, and as farmers and, and uh, cattle herders, uh, herding people for maybe 10,000 years, We've only lived as industrial people for you know, 150, 200, 250 years maximum. And that is what has resulted in absolutely unbelievable change in technologies. And then, of course, uh, the question of how, how much longer can this reliance on fossil fuel technology continue? Here, another extraordinary image of urban growth uh, since the 1950s. So really, you know, a staggering change on life on, on, on this planet. And the key question really is, how can all of this become or be, be compatible with life on Earth as a whole? Uh, this is quite a familiar image by now. You know, this picture wouldn't have been possible uh, both, you know, to take this photograph uh, before satellites existed, but also before the Earth lit up in this way ever since power stations uh, and transport systems based on fossil fuels became the norm on this planet. So just a few kind of summary points here about the changes that have taken place in terms of human numbers, in terms of urban numbers. Uh, uh, we know about the figure of 50% or there about slightly over 50% of people living, uh, urban people living on this planet today. And so uh, the next point, you know, is 60% of about 5 billion people are expected to live in urban areas. And that will be four times the entire world population in 1900. And the final point, very importantly, and that's a really key part of my talk, is that while cities are relatively dense places, as we've heard again and again in various talks, uh, they use the bulk of the world's resources, and this is a key point, and their ecological footprints, of course, stretch across the planet. A couple of images here of change of urban areas. This is uh, Pudong in the heart of, what is now the heart of Shanghai, uh, in uh, uh, 1979, this is what it looks like today. It's the same landscape. Well, it's not the same landscape, of course. <laughs> so this is the Manhattan of, uh, of China today, of course. And that, of course, would not be possible without the associated uh, trading, production, and uh, other systems that have developed there in just as a result of the fact that uh, Shanghai was uh, a place where cheap wages were the norm and where manufacturers could relocate to, uh, as they then did from uh, the uh, 1980s onwards. Now here's, uh, I think, a very interesting slide, which is two cities, the same population pretty much, Atlanta and Barcelona. But look at the actual urban footprint here. This is the actual uh, location, the area of, on which these cities are built. 
absolutely astonishing difference. And this is what it looks like in reality here. Low density uh, urbanization uh, based on uh, the mo private motor car on large plots of land uh, where people live uh, with their families or, you know. Uh, and this is the same, th this is the transport systems associated with that, of course. And this is what's happening in Barcelona instead. Basically, uh, a public transport based uh, and uh, uh, department, uh, apartment building based. So total difference in terms of the <laughs> environmental impact. And of course, we've heard a lot about the importance of density as a way of trying to make our cities more sustainable. But the reality is, even if we live in these very dense places, we still have extraordinary per capita energy use taking place. This is the kind of figure for, for Europe where each one of us who have a at maximum muscle power output, if we are strong guys like sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger at his prime, he had a sort of uh, maximum output of about 100 watts of muscle power. Whereas we today in Europe take for granted some 6,000 watts of, of uh, energy that we have available on a daily basis. And that applies just as much to Barcelona. In, in, in the United States, the figure is about twice as high as that. So the low density uh, landscape that we saw a moment ago there would require, of course, significantly more energy, mainly for transportation purposes. So you know, the biological energy that we use is minuscule compared with the fossil fuel energy that we take for granted in our daily lives. Now, cities are mainly discussed as places of buildings, of places where we live, whereas what, what the, the, the resources flowing through our cities, which is the electricity, the water, and so on, are really not discussed very much as part of the overall discussion about urban systems functioning. So the ecological footprints of cities, which are the locations outside our cities, not urban footprints, but ecological footprints, uh, in other parts of the world, this is what makes the existence of our cities possible. And that's a really critical issue. We already heard quite a bit about this from Sousa. I won't go into much further detail than that. But London, uh, I had an opportunity some years ago to, stand a, to do a sort of uh, initial study of London's ecological footprint. And I found this is the sort of figure that I came up with. Roughly about 125 times the actual surface area of London was required to supply it with uh, living resources, from uh, not just from the UK's uh, own hinterland, but from around the world. In fact, a subsequent study nearly doubled that figure because I hadn't included food waste, I hadn't included uh, pet food, is quite a substantial area required to produce those. Yeah. And then also, in addition, I had not included marine, marine resources, fishing. So a more recent study than mine, mine was done in 95, the other one around 2000, came up with a figure nearly uh, two, 300 times uh, London's surface area is actual ecological footprint. So these are the sort of actual footprints around the world that we take for granted to get our resources from. Uh, so uh, burning rainforest on the right-hand side there, the conversion of rainforest into into uh, the soya bean fields over there in Mato Grosso in southern Brazil to, to uh, feed our animals, uh, and of course the areas required for mining. So we are seeing the extraordinary development of urbanization across the face of the earth, and Dubai is just a classical example of recent urban growth. But it's a location where there's practically no natural resources available. There's no water available there. There's no food available because there doesn't rain there uh, for the same reason as there's no water available. So what p do people do? So they, of course, they try their best to use uh, water from beneath the desert, uh, such as these uh, center pivot irrigated fields to produce crops to feed these cities. But the reality is more often the food actually comes from much further afield, again, from, some, from somewhere like the Amazon or from Malaysia or Indonesia, uh, former rain rainforest areas. So it is really critically important when we look at cities as systems to think beyond the edge of the city. And I would go, go as far as saying that urbanism at the present time is almost in a pre-Galilean mode, which is basically one takes the city as the center of the universe, but the ecosystems on which cities depend are not really taken into consideration very much. So I think that's a critical issue that needs to be addressed by urbanism at this moment in time, also by urban ecology as a discipline, because urban ecology is primarily concerned 
with what life within cities, uh, non-human life primarily, but not life in places halfway around the world that cities depend on. Uh, this is another picture from the Middle East where I was working quite a lot recently, showing the uh, huge quantities of waste simply being dumped on the edge of Curitiba, uh, sorry, not Curitiba, <laughs> I was looking at Jamie Lerner there, <laughs> of, of Dubai, of, of Riyadh, of, of Jeddah and so on. And uh, simply dumped there, left there uh, to rot in the desert. It's extraordinary how you, you see these rings of waste, not just this kind of waste, but also old cars, old tires and so on, that are simply left there in the desert. And this is another really critical issue in my view, which is the fact that we in our cities consume these enormous quantities of food, but what happens to the sewage? It ends up most, more often than not in, in uh, local waters here in, in Rio de Janeiro, picture taken from a plane on, on my way to São Paulo. And uh, this, this is not just a problem of pollution of the coastal waters, but also the fact that there is n uh, the nutrient transport from farmland through our stomachs um, away from, from the land to be never returned to the farmland uh, that ultimately is required to be kept productive. So what was the response? In the 19th century in London, uh, it was necessary for the first time to build a major sewage system for a city. And so uh, there was the year of the great stink in 1858, when everybody, uh, the parliamentarians, were passing out in the House of Parliaments and saying, chaps, we really got to do something about this because all of this stuff was ending up in the Thames. So they decided to uh, commission Mr. Bazalgette to build a sewage disposal system. Not a recycling system, but a disposal system. So all the nutrients coming out of the stomachs of Londoners, and before that from farmland feeding them, ended up like this. And then uh, once we'd, w the sludge was uh, processed somewhat, it ended up further down in the Thames estuary. Well, it's very interesting. There was a major discussion across Europe at that time and in Berlin, they took a different decision, which was they built uh, a, a sewage farm, sewage farms around the edge of the city, and all the nutrients uh, from the sewage was actually deposited in, uh, in, in, uh, in you know, vegetable gardens and orchards and so on. And this continued till about the 1970s, until at that, at that time, the problem of heavy metal contamination became an issue that they were getting quite concerned about. So only in the 1970s was this uh, uh, project uh, finally abandoned. Another key issue, air pollution is considered to be you know, a key problem of, of cities around the world. And just the other day there was a report from, uh, from the United Nations stating that virtually every major city around the planet has really significant air pollution problems here in Mexico City, where it's not only the emissions from vehicles, but also uh, floating particles from, from sewage ending up in the air like this. So the discussion about air pollution until recently was primarily concerned about how it affected people's health within cities, whereas today increasingly the impact of urban fossil fuel burning is increasingly seen as a global issue, which is the carbon dioxide coming out of cities and causing contributions to the increase on CO2 in the atmosphere. So now, in the last few days, there have been really terrifying reports about the melting of ice, not just in Greenland, as these, this particular picture shows, but also in the Antarctic, where the West Antarctic glaciers are now found to be melting at an accelerated rate. And the IPCC, the Intergovernment Inter 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 Panel on Climate Change, now predicts that if the current trends that are being found in the Antarctic are likely to continue, we are going to see not half a meter, not one meter, but potentially three meters of sea level rise on this planet. Where are most cities located? Major cities and coastal locations. So I, I've had this uh, picture in reserve, hold it in reserve sometimes for talks, and I haven't used it for a while. But now with this latest report, we really have to think about what happens to Shanghai, what happens to Dhaka, what happens to Cairo, what happens not only to farm uh, to the cities themselves, but the farmland that feeds these cities, if this sea level rise continues. 
But now, to kind of end my talk on a more positive note, here's just a talk about the change in, that can take place in a city. In this instance, in Adelaide, South Australia, where I was invited uh, in 2003 to be a thinker in residence, specifically to make proposals for the greening of uh, the city region. And so, here are a summary images showing the remarkable transformation in the energy system of that city, with really significant wind power development, with really dramatic increase in solar energy, uh, driven by feed-in tariffs, as, a, as a, pos pol a policy originally introduced from Europe, where the first buses in the world running on solar electricity are now actually running. This particular bus here on the right-hand side is powered by the solar panels on the bus garage on the left-hand side over there. Solar villages like Bedzer have also been built in Adelaide as well. So remarkable stuff has been achieved, and that was driven primarily by the administration of the uh, Premier of South Australia at the time, Mike Rahn, uh, who decided that he wanted to put Adelaide on the map as a region that really showed what can be done in terms of transforming not only the re energy and uh, resource use performance of the city, but also how one can create a new economy out of this process. So building uh, retrofits, really significant uh, uh, in, uh, money spent on, uh, on uh, making these public buildings much more efficient than they were before. Uh, and then going for a circular metabolism, differentiating between the organic waste on the left, which have to be treated separately from the technical waste on the right. And that's also uh, widely uh, used now as a concept uh, by, by organizations uh, around the world concerned with cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, industrial development. So, you know, what do we do with plastic waste? Well, we can turn them into, into park benches, we can turn them into fence posts. Why don't we do it? It is perfectly possible technology-wise to do so, but basically that is considered to be cost-ineffective by and large. So it's really not being done on anything like the scale. And in South Wales, where I live, we have no longer, uh, we have to pay for plastic bags. But then there's all the plastic trays in the supermarket. What do we do with those? Can we turn them into long-lasting uh, materials and products like these? Organic waste. In Adelaide, there was practically no organic waste recycling uh, 12 years ago. And now much of it is turned into huge quantities of compost, which is processed on the edge of the city on a former uh, landfill site, and is turned into a compost for use for urban farming on the edge of the city. And uh, it's an interesting example, similar example actually from Bristol. Wessex Water, until a few years ago, produced something called Biogran, which was basically dehydrated sewage sludge, turned into pellets. What, has been, what was done with it? It was turned primarily into the uh, new greenfield sites in places like Merthyr Tidwell and elsewhere in South Wales, where l new, new uh, forests have been planted using the recycled sewage of the people of Bristol. But in, in Adelaide, they've gone further. They're also taking the wastewater from the city, and together with the organic waste of the city, uh, have turned it into wonderfully productive farmland that's now producing the bulk of the food consumed in South Australia, and it's all marketed, and this is a very important point, is marketed without packaged in plastics in a, in a market rather than a supermarket for the people of Adelaide. And I've been talking to George uh, Ferguson about the importance of creating markets again in Bristol to actually be able to compete with supermarkets in the future. Another thing they did in Adelaide, uh, which came out of our work there uh, 11 years ago, was to very large-scale reforestation on the edge of the city because there was soil erosion, there was a uh, massive uh, loss of uh, topsoil as a result of deforestation. So some three million uh, trees have been planted on the edge of Adelaide to try and restore this uh, denuded land. So just a kind of summary of what can be achieved in a city region in just 10 years or so. 30% renewable energy, large-scale uh, development of renewable energy on individual households, solar hot water systems everywhere, large-scale wind power, water-sensitive development, um, efficient uh, buildings, massive composting initiatives, and 20,000 hectares uh, on the edge of the city used for vegetable and food crops, utilizing the organic waste 
from the city. Uh, all of this uh, might sound, particularly when it comes to energy, might sound like pie in the sky. The reality is we can decouple our cities from fossil fuel technologies. The price of solar and wind and other uh, renewable energy technologies has been going down dramatically, partly driven, <coughs> partly driven by, by feed-in tariffs across Europe, which have made the uh, uh, engineering op op opportunities much greater than they were before. So we are seeing the opportunities in renew renewable energy development for cities. This is the largest wind farm in the world off the coast of uh, London, uh, off the coast of Kent, the London Array. There was a similar plan for Bristol, the Atlantic Array, for, for the moment that's not going through. But certainly London uh, is now supplying the equivalent of some 30% of its domestic electricity uh, from, from that particular wind farm. And that's not been publicized to anything like the degree that it should have been. Amazing new types of uh, architecture. Here is Stadium in Taiwan, which is a solar power station, which uh, you know, supplies a large part of the, of the region nearby with, with solar electricity. Uh, in China, amazing new types of architecture uh, coming up. Uh, uh, in China, there's more solar hot water systems, uh, more solar system, hot water installed on buildings than anywhere else in the world. That's not been publicized either. In, in Spain, in Seville, the city of Seville largely runs on renewable electricity from nearby solar power stations, and they can have now found ways of storing that electricity at night in, in salt uh, uh, solutions. So it's possible to continue producing electricity from solar farms even till after midnight. And a lot of this is happening in, in Britain now as well. Solar farms on, on, on actual farms themselves how we can uh, enable farmers uh, to make uh, uh, an additional income uh, from their land in addition to the grazing of animals or the plowing, you know, the, the crops that they grow. So all of these are possibilities that are now being realized and I think it's of critical importance, as we heard from Mr. Dasiking, uh, the importance of young people picking up these messages. So certainly for the green capital in Bristol to you know, to project these kind of messages in schools and in participatory workshops is of absolutely critical importance for the future. So to kind of summarize the key points then, we need to start thinking about uh, beyond the edge of the city. We need to think about the critical importance of decoupling our cities from fossil fuel technology. We need to regenerate soils in the urban hinterland with organic matter. We need to get serious about large-scale urban uh, forestry, but also forests beyond cities for carbon sequestration, for uh, all manner of different uh, environmental improvements, restoring watersheds in some parts of the world, regenerative water supplies in the Middle East and elsewhere, but above all else, building a human attachment to nature as part of our thinking of ci as city people, and then critically important, building a new green economy in our cities. Thank you.